Good evening. Welcome to Bear Pond Books. Thanks for coming out during this rainy and blustery evening. It's kind of a perfect night for a, a Joe Gunther series. Just a perfect night to curl up with this book. Um, You're saying I'm blustery. I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just checking. Um, I'm not quite sure how Joe Gunther managed to star in 29 novels, quite a feat, when there's only 11 homicides a year in our state. I know. Is that right? Yeah, but they're all his. They're all <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, is that, a, that seems Whoa. like a book right there. Anyway, um, as you can see, I'm not totally caught up on all my Archer Mayer novels, because if I read all 29, I'd probably know how he does 11 homicides in 29 books. But we're very excited. Um, to welcome Archer Mayer tonight. Now it's the time for you. <laughs> Just a few housekeeping items. Please mute or turn off your cell phones. Uh, please use the back door if you need to exit during the reading. Uh, we will lock the front door until after the talk. <laughs> and that could be funny. Uh, the bathroom's located at the back of the store to the right. We do have a newsletter list going around. If you'd like to learn about uh, future Bear Pond Books events, please sign up. Uh, in a few weeks, we're hosting Madeline Kunin, Vermont's first woman governor. Um, she'll be here October 16th to launch her new memoir, Coming of Age, My Journal to the 80s. We will also have a state representative here to give an introduction, and they will talk about women in politics in the state of Vermont, um, a timely discussion. Other events this fall include Garrett Graff, Major Jackson and Ed Corin. So please follow us on Facebook and Twitter and sign up for the newsletter. I'd like to thank Orca Media. They're here tonight filming the event and the Vermont Arts Council for featuring tonight's event as a Vermont Arts 2018 program. I'd also like to thank you in advance uh, for buying copies of the brand new Archer Mayer book, Bury the Lead. We have them here tonight. Registers are open. And if Archer's in a good mood, I think he'll sign books tonight, right? <laughs> no, he won't sign books tonight. Um, the Chicago Tribune describes Archer's Vermont-based Joe Gunther novels as the best police procedurals, proce procedurals? Yes. Yeah, yeah, right. to procedurals. It sounds an odd. Procedurals. <laughs> yeah, some words are like that, though, right? Mm -hmm. Procedurals uh, being written in America. He's a past winner of the New England Independent Booksellers Association Award for Fiction. Um, he got Best Fiction, and that was the first time a crime writer won the Fiction Award. In 2011, Mayer's 22nd Joe Gunther novel, Tagman, earned a place on the New York Times bestseller list. So thank you, all of you, for getting that book. Um, Archer Mayer is currently a death investigator for Vermont's Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Over the past 30 years, he's been a detective for the Wyndham County Sheriff's Office, a volunteer firefighter and EMT, and the publisher of his own backlist, many of which we have at the counter. He's also a frequent contributor to magazines and newspapers. We are so thrilled he joins us once a year. Please welcome Archer Mayer. wanted to sit in that, but I refuse to. <laughs> so I'll pose languorously next to the podium. And I won't move too terribly much for the sake of the camera guy, uh, who usually hate me because I move too much. Uh, there was, in fact, many, 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 many years ago, uh, before uh, Vermont Public TV acquired taste, that they had me on a program. And uh, uh, I was being interviewed by a woman whose name I forget, but she's the one with the gaff in the front teeth that we have all oh, seen yeah. for years. Yeah, exactly. Oh, her, Sam right. Star, you know. Yeah, yeah Sam Star, yeah, for whatever. Anyhow, so she's talking away, charming, nice, lively conversation. And as you've already seen, I move these flappers around <coughs> quite a bit. Uh, and I'm doing so. Uh, and I'm being particularly expansive. I don't know why. Um, maybe it was the gap. <laughs> but uh, in any case, I all of a sudden became dimly aware, because it's a very gloomy thing, because all the spots are on you, and oh, yeah, there's yeah. blackness all around, which is kind of cool. And we're on a raised dais, and uh, sitting at a chair and table, looking like we were oh so cool in our living room, which we're not. So. Babble, 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 going back and forth, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I noticed the camera guy is getting farther and farther <laughs> away. And, and as he backs up, he keeps doing this. 
But it turns out the edge of the dais is <laughs> right there. And he's got this 600 pound camera on, oh. on rollers, sort of threatening to go, come on, come on, I want to land on you and crush your chest. So he stops, obviously. But later, after the program was done and you know their, their subscription rate was canceled and they almost <laughs> went off the air, uh, the question came up, you know, hey, Bernie, we almost lost you there. You, you were right on the end, he said, but he, he kept doing this with his hands. I couldn't cut off his hands. I had to get him in the shot. You know, so I damn near killed the cameraman. So I, uh, I see your back is against the wall, so obviously you guys are talking to each other. He said, you know, this is bonehead showing up. You better prepare, prepare yourself. Uh, Barry the lead. Barry the lead comes with a disclaimer and an explanation, tedious as I could possibly make it. It's, uh, in fact, before the acknowledgments, before uh, uh, almost the title page, you will come upon a page that says an explanation about the, um, the whatever that's called, title. <laughs> Thank you. Bury the lead is an old newspaper phrase, okay, which probably everybody knows uh, in this room. But obviously it says that you got to say what you're going to say f right out front before you follow with the rest of the article. Otherwise, people are going to go, what the hell is he talking about? Or they're just going to go somewhere else and that'll be the end of it. Well... I've been burying the lead for my entire career because obviously I don't want you to know exactly what's going on immediately in these books. I want to keep the surprise until the tail end. So I've taken my journalistic background, all the training I received, and I've turned it completely bass backwards. But the controversy is not there. The controversy came uh, from my New York editor who said, well, I can't say I'm crazy about the title but I can't think of anything better. <laughs> so High praise. Says, yeah, exactly. So we're stuck with it, I guess. I went, well, fine, gosh. <laughs> Good thing I called you late in the day. Um, almost drinking time. So um, the point is that uh, he said people are going to mispronunciate it. They're going to take a look at Barry the Lead, and they're going to say, says he, Barry the Lead. Mm -hmm. And I paused, poetically and dramatically, and then I said, Keith, there are murder mysteries. Where's the damage? <laughs> and even he got it at that point. And went, oh, yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Now, the only pompous uh, subtext to this, and th I say this here and now to sort of inhibit you to a certain extent during the question and answer period, which is about 37 seconds away, and that is that one can also encounter this phrase spelt L-E-D-E -E because we classicists know that after Gutenberg went away and they came up with far more pragmatic ways of laying out type, they did so in lead. And since the first dictionary wasn't invented until the mid-1700s, lead was spelt how you hear it. And in the old days, that was L-E-D-E. -E. I don't know why they were so fond of E's, but it is the most popular letter in the English alphabet, so I guess that's why. They just go crazy. <laughs> so I was informed rather archly that if you really wanted to write this properly, you should have written it, bury the L-E-D-E. -E. <laughs> to which I was able to say, we ain't in England. <laughs> so I'm spelling it this way because that's not the way we spell it in the United States. So he was a little flummox, this fellow. I decided I would throw that out to spare all of you classicists who are going to crowd me up later. <laughs> Am I sounding strangely paranoid? You know, aging is an odd process for me. <laughs> Let's see, Barry Lee. Now, the problem with Barry Lee is I have to remember what it's about. <laughs> I'm in the middle of, wait for it, Bomber's Moon. Ooh. Bomber. Oh, I like the response. That's good. No, don't give me no Barry the Lead twice in a row. <laughs> Bomber's Moon is now, when did I reach this morning? 
page 335 or something like that. I, I, yeah, I can't seem to shut up on this book. I haven't even, I don't even know who done it yet. I'm still <laughs> trying to sort that out. Um, so uh, uh, Bomber's Moon is what's in my head. I've got all the details there. So if you really want to know what I'm doing, that's what I'm doing. But curiously, it has nothing to do with what you were, of course, going to buy Co five copies of, um, <laughs> uh, so we're we're sort of stuck with my memory lapse here. But if memory has it, um, I think uh, that this book uh, starts off with an autopsy because that's my comfort zone. Uh, so we <laughs> start with what you know best, and um, then uh, sort of starts wandering on. Uh, as usual, I'm wearing sort of several narratives, um, but I got approached by several people. Uh, before this book was conjured up, and as you old timers know, who who has not heard me before? Oh wow, good lord! Wow, I, so it was like jury duty. They just pulled you off the street. <laughs> I'm impressed. That's very cool. Thank you, thank you to management. Um, I thought only judges did that. But that's okay. Um, so a guy approached me and said that he was security uh, head. He'd just been uh, taken off of uh, law enforcement, a good pal of mine, and put in as number two or three or two and a half, it depends on the structure, uh, of security at CNS Warehouse, which is a ginormous, to use my daughter's phrase, uh, organization uh, for wholesale groceries. So that was sort of percolating in my brain because they have a huge warehouse in Brattleboro. And talk about a good place to either blow stuff up or run people over or flick a bit in the wrong quarters. You know, so my brain was starting to work along that. And this guy, of course, head of security, huh, was more than delighted to help me figure out ways to blow up his building. So <laughs> my friends are pretty selected, I might add. So that was the first thing that was sort of running around there. The autopsies, just as I mentioned, are natural. So that's always there from book to book. In fact, I have to sort of quell my enthusiasm for autopsies and try to get through a book without mentioning one. So, but no such luck this time. Um, the uh, other thing was, and this was a, sort of a minor miracle. As you know, Willie Kunkel, to match his poor attitude, has poor symmetry since he's got a bum arm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you write, you have that mirror thing going on, so that's always hard. As you know, as a medical examiner, it's always difficult. You're looking at the dead guy, and you're describing that he has a broken right arm, but. It's, it's not on your right, it's his right. Oh, uh, God, I've, been, I've been doing <laughs> this medical garbage for decades and decades and decades, and I still have trouble with that mirror stuff. So anyhow, so I've never quite figured out which bum arm is Willie's until I check over my own notes. And this has not helped. Several decades ago, the Brattleboro itself held a murder mystery weekend. Uh, and uh, in part and parcel of that exercise, they got a bunch of amateur uh, actors to wander the streets of Brattleboro for Saturday and Sunday, enacting a murder uh -huh. and solving it. So you had Joe and Willie and Sam and all the characters. Huh? The problem is the guy they chose for Willie had the same problem I did. He couldn't remember. So periodically, he would show up like that, or he'd show up like that. <laughs> that really baffled the onlookers. Uh, the other problem was the guy who was enacting Joe Gunther took his role so seriously that real cops actually had to take him aside and say, you know, you, you can't actually impersonate an officer. <laughs> so they cut it out and stow the badge. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a little creepy. But hey, that's the company I keep. So somebody, a fan, comes up to me and says, speaking of Willie Kunkel, and he's sort of standing asymmetrically in front of me, says, I got what he's got. I went, oh my god, you got a bum arm? I went, yeah, I was mugged several uh, decades ago uh, by a guy in Washington, D.C., uh, and he stabbed me in the arm after I gave him my wallet in great. 
and it created nerve damage and rendered this poor guy's arm in exactly the same condition as Willie Kunkel's. And he said, given that insight, would you like me to tell you what it's like being Willie Kunkel? Uh, <laughs> That's oh, good come on, that's too easy. <laughs> yes, exactly right. So I said, okay, now I got an autopsy. I got the CNS warehouse to be blown up, and I've got the real Willie Kunkel. So he told me about his travails. I dug a little bit into his uh, history, his medical history, brought it up to my brother, the ever-available retired surgeon, and then he stuck me into this whole engineering orthopedic research thing at Mary Hitchcock and Dartmouth College, all of which have become pals over the years. And we began to problem solve about what's happened over the years to Willie's arm in terms of development to his, uh, to his discomfort. How do we remedy it? And what are the choices there? And what are the end results of that? And so that's in this book, too. So for the science nerds, you're going to be delighted. Hell of the murder mystery. Who cares, right? But uh, for that stuff, so we're going to see Willie go through all of that. But naturally, it's Willie. So wherever he goes to have himself treated, there's going to be an overlaying problem. And sure enough, the hospital shuts down because of that problem, which I won't mention at the moment because I can't ruin the entire book for you. <laughs> but that sort of takes care of Barry the lead lead Letty. <laughs> um, and I hope you enjoy it. And like I said, I hope you buy five copies. So I promised that this would be a Q&A. The old timers, unknown to some of you. Uh, know that I'm totally dedicated to questions and answers because even to this day, even with the, the people I should be paying because you come up every year, right? right? For how many years? Oh, I guess you many can't years even count. We've run out of fingers right. and toes. Right. I know. That's true. Me too. <laughs> but this is the drill. I still don't know why any of you come out, especially on a rainy night, to see the likes of me. So therefore, we open it up to questions as quickly as possible so that you can pick my brains what few are left. <laughs> yes? How old were you when you published your first book? How old was I when I published my first book? Well phrased, because that separates it from writing, which I began eight years before that first publication, which occurred in 1988. 1988 was a good year. I was, at that point, had been working for eight years as an itinerant historian uh, and traveling all over the United States writing books for hire, which was actually a pretty good gig, except that uh, my record for time away from home was nine weeks at a stretch. Uh, when I came home, I'd have to be prepped with photographs of my child so that I wouldn't mistake her for someone else. I and mean, it was, it was uh, obviously not a good thing to do. And I remember <coughs> telephoning my wife once, feeling quite hairy-chested at the time because I had gone through, no kidding, a raging snowstorm to get to the only phone in this community, which was up in the northeast corner of Michigan, uh, uh, what they call the UP. And I reached this phone, which was literally in a booth <laughs> about this size, and slammed the door, and all the howling quieted down, and I dialed the phone, and I picked up, my wife picked up the phone, and I could hear the aforementioned now middle-aged child howling in the background. <laughs> and my wife's first comment was, not, hello, honey, not, oh, I'm so impressed that you survived your odor, the owner's journey, right? She said, if you were here right now, I'd kill you. <laughs> oh, I better go home as quickly as possible. <laughs> so, uh, those were, uh, as they euphemistically say, the salad years. Uh, I wrote my first novel in 1975. I was working as a uh, scholarly editor for the University of Texas Press. I, too, once had class and knew how to wear tweed. Uh, <laughs> and uh, surrounded by what they call ABDs. How many people know what ABDs are? Yes, of course. All but dissertation. All but dissertation, correct, sir. 
So uh, the retirement home for ABDs are university presses. At least they were in the old days. <laughs> Attitude ran very thick among ABDs because now they were asked to judge on the merits of PhDs, who, of course, in order to publish or perish, would send their impenetrable do uh, you know, tomes to the universe, local <coughs> university press to get published. And the ABDs then had the right to go, what? This is completely unacceptable. <laughs> so being surrounded by such people uh, drove me to the bonkers, and I would leave campus on a regular basis to research interesting projects that were not written by PhDs and bring them to fruition and publication. The end result of this turned out rather unhappily because I found a product that ended up on the New York Times bestseller list for six months. Now, all of us, non-ABD or anything else, would think that that's a good thing, right? No, mm -hmm. no, 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 no. You forget the environment I was inhabiting. University of Presses making the bestseller list for six months results in cash. Ew. <laughs> Precisely right. Ew. Ew was the operative response because they're you know, very tacky. This is the 1970s after all. We do have principles and one of them is not to make money. <laughs> I'm a scholarly press. I've got better things to do than to chase the almighty dollar. So I was chastised and banished to never leave my office again. In fact, I even found another one that would have ended up on the bestseller list and the director took it away from me, literally said, Arch, walk away. <laughs> I was so tempted to take it literally, but instead I just went back to my office, took out my, my typewriter, rolled it in a piece of paper, and immediately started writing a murder mystery with the director as the first victim. <laughs> <laughs> Impulse writing, what can I say? <laughs> so that brought me from 1975 to 1980 because, of course, that was an exercise in typing, followed by yet another, followed by a third, followed by a fourth. I have quite a filing cabinet filled with impenetrable prose of my own, thank you very much, all filled with dead directors. <laughs> so once I snapped out of that habit, uh, I realized that I just couldn't stand the company I was keeping. So I left that environment. In fact, I left full-term employment altogether, by meaning uh, benefits and retirement and a paycheck and a nine-to-five and all that. That was 1978, and I've never looked back. I've never had a full-time job with those things ever since. I've been an independent contractor, including as a death investigator, as a cop, and all the things I've done, I only will take them on if the people hiring will hire me by contract mm -hmm. instead <laughs> of by employment. Uh, so uh, long story short, um, I was uh, unemployed. I had no money. I had no expectations, no skills, really marketable skills. So I came to Vermont. <laughs> you know, for God's sake, I needed company, like-minded company. So immediately embraced as soon as I crossed the uh, the border. I was so peripatetic that from the age of zero to thirty, I lived in approximately thirty different places, three continents, and God knows how many countries. After I came to Vermont, I lived in two, and I lived in the same house for 36 years. Me too. <laughs> so, obviously, I'm happy. <laughs> and if someone says, are you a native Vermonter? I said, no, but I've arrested a few. <laughs> you now it makes them wonder if that was a relative that I arrested or not. Yeah. Anyhow, so I, um, having set down my roots, realized I still didn't have any marketable skills, even though I was in friendly company at long last, uh, and everyone else around me was unemployed, so that was a comforting feeling. Uh, but how many other people's driveway do you shovel? I mean, the barter system only goes so far. And so I realized that I must have been trained in something. I had a vague memory of uh, getting a degree from college, 
So I chased <laughs> it up, unfolded it, uh, took a look, and it said, history. Hmm. I'm a historian. I'm a trained <laughs> historian. So being not shy on the bullshit factor, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I uh, worked the telephone, called Texas, because Texas was the land of the rich and the vain in those days, and I had just come from it, because that's where the University Press was. So I was familiar with them, and I said to the first person who answered the phone, you need a historian. <laughs> and she said, I do. <laughs> Couldn't believe it. It took me, what, a week and a half when I had my first job. So I was inordinate, weird. Uh, and utterly destabilizing to my family, but it began me down the road of writing because that's what I'd become. During the weekends, it turns out, people have a deep prejudice about seeing historians. <laughs> I don't know why. So I stayed in my Motel 6s, wherever they happened to be, and I began to work or follow up on killing directors, only now I was no longer director obsessed because now I was a happily employed historian. And so I began to broaden my horizon and I began to sort of think about other types of novels than the ones that I had been fussing around with. Uh, and the murder mystery seemed interesting to me for both creative reasons and practical ones. At the time, they were gangbusters in popularity. I mean, they were just rising, dare I say, with a bullet. So uh, that was obviously something to grab hold on because at that point, simultaneously, the average income of an American writer was approximately five to six thousand dollars a year. <laughs> Even then, that wasn't much. So you had to go for the high end. I was going to go for the full six. And that would be detective fiction. Well, I actually don't really enjoy detective fiction. I don't read it. That's all of a conversation killer when they come to me and say, oh, good Lord, look what you do for a living. Who's your favorite murder mystery writer? I go, I don't have one. I don't read that stuff. I mean, look at my life, for God's sake. You think I'm going to cozy up with a nice recreational murder mystery at the end of my day? No. <laughs> I want to get rid of all that stuff. Imagine five minutes with no blood, gar, and guts. And that odor. So, um, I uh, ended up thinking of the murder mystery in different ways. And I think that's why I ended up writing about Joe Gunther to begin with but also why I have never left him 30 years later. And that is that these are, in a funny kind of way, not murder mysteries at all. They're, they're cultural anthropologies. They're social histories. They're stories about us, about Vermont, about conflict resolution, about people under stress, about irrational behavior, poor problem-solving skills. In other words, everything we face and deal with every day. Only maxed up a little bit, because I'd like to think most of you don't step over a dead body before you start out on the day's labors, or end it that way. Um, and I do in all of these. There's only one book in the series where there's no dead body, and that's because the book is about sexual assault, which I consider a homicide. Only without a dead body, the body rises up and says, deal with me too on top of the crime. So I didn't want to have the distraction of a homicide uh, in traditional terms in that book. Um, and um, what's the name of that one? I'm trying to remember it. Yeah, you and me both. Oh. Uh, Fruits of the Poisonous Tree. Yeah. Good yeah. memory. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Fruits of the Poisonous Tree is the only murder mystery without a real quote-unquote murder. Um, so. Given that incentive, given that reflection of what it is that actually makes murder mysteries alive and function in my brain, I began to understand that I'm not writing a series of separate books. I'm writing chapters of a, of a book without end. I'm making James Joyce weep <laughs> and Tolstoy and all the other long-winded guys who thought they could all do it between two covers. 
the hell to that? You just keep going and going and going. And you tell a story of a group of people which have now so expanded that I almost need a, a chart to keep track of them because I, I rattled off, you know, Joe and Willie and Sam and Lester and even Lester is a latecomer. Right. And now you've got Lester's kids because one of his sons, I mean, time goes on. Joe never ages, but everyone else does. It's uh, a good thing. Imagine an 85-year-old cop. Right. That work. So um, we've got uh, Beverly Hillstrom. Uh, she's always been there, but uh, she and Joe are now an item. And she, of course, uh, had a, well, not of course, but she did have a previous marriage and had two daughters, one of whom lives in Vermont. Well, that character needs a life, and now she's been employed by the Brattleboro Deformer, which we locals call the, uh, the Deformer. It should be the Reformer, I Reformer. Yes. I was <laughs> Sorry about that. A little local slip. It's like my mom, who is unkillable, she's 98 years old, lives in an old folks' home in Hanover, New Hampshire, and refers to the Valley News as the snooze. <laughs> So it runs in the family. Right? And so the reformer has hired Beverly Hilson's daughter as a photojournalist. Well, you can see that, you know, I can't kill them all. I have tried to kill some of the returning characters. Uh, but uh, Sally Kravitz, who is Dan Kravitz's daughter, she's, she's alive and well in Bomber's Moon next year. So. All of you guys are going to have to equip yourselves with a chart in, in short order. Either that or I'm going to have this hellacious bus, bus crash. <laughs> and everybody's going to die. Everyone's going to die. Exactly right. My mother, uh, back in her salad years, at one point she's reading, God knows why, except that she's a, she's a sort of promiscuous reader. She, she's always got three to four books uh, on her table along with several crossword puzzles. Um, did I mention that her mind is fine? <laughs> yeah. So anyhow, so there she is, this bed over crippled old lady, you know, just reading like a stevedore. Mm. Uh, and uh, where am I going? I lost it. Damn, I always do that. Oh. It's a tradition. Yeah. Yes, see? That's Every time I lose my train of thought. Is she at Kendall? Of all the characters. Yeah, yeah. something like that. But. I don't remember what the original question was. No, cool, cool. Are you kidding? I dealt with that hours ago. You didn't answer it. Oh, I don't know. She didn't ask how old it was. Yes, she did. She did. Oh, good Not me. Well, you said the year. I said the year. I was 25, so 1988, I was 38. 38, that's your answer. <laughs> so, what's your Where timing? Around? How are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you could hang feeling in there. guilty or are you feeling hopeful? Feeling hopeful. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. See? Forever 22. <laughs> 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 I don't know. No. Just like two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Good catch. Good that wasn't catch. my question. Yes, no, no, but you remembered it, which is a hell of a lot more than I'm going to do. Mom has like three or four books always going. Yes, I know that part, some, but I don't remember where I was heading with all of that. You don't know why. She's well, she reading one of your no, books? No, she does read my book. She calls me up very politely and says uh, it was a nice read. <laughs> <laughs> Notice that uh, the hostess of the evening didn't quote my mother. <laughs> An okay read. Didn't kill me. Uh, <laughs> no, my mom's really good. I, I actually, to my father, who died at 99, uh, uh, I dedicated uh, more uh, more than one book, so they're good folks, and they uh, they stood by me in tough times. Uh, so at one point, needless to say, uh, in all this pursuit of art, I uh, ran very shy of funds, and my my old man floated me for a loan. And it was a loan shark's loan. No <laughs> kidding. I mean, that, the idea was that if I got published, uh, blah, blah, blah. I mean, this wasn't very long alone, but for obvious reasons, as you'll soon discover, um, that if I was successful, uh, he would get 50% of the proceeds. Or, well, hell, well, take, my, take my leg while you're at it. You know. For the rest of your life? But, well, yeah, I mean, I, I was too stunned to ask for details. But, and I agreed. I took the money. You know, this is good. So for this short interim, uh, I floated. But it, it, it because I was just trying to hit this deadline, I hit the deadline. Book was rejected. And I went back to the old man, and I said... Uh, Guess what? You know, you, you put your money on a dead pony. Uh, 
And he, he gave me that eyeball and said, uh, this is an old New Englander, and he said, did you discover that this is what you really want to do? And I went, oh, yeah, absolutely. Because this bought me the time to do nothing else but. And he said, well, then I've been repaid in full. Aww. Oh, wow, really? That's a good story. Well, I, I know he made that up. Yeah. He felt good at the time. You know, I was, wow. I was a total buy-in of that. Yeah, he's a good guy. Who else got a question? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I, I forgot the first one, and then I ignored it, so, you know, it doesn't really matter, but, uh, but I'm trying to be polite here. Yes, sir. How, how tempted are you to kill off recurring characters? Oh, I've done it. Yeah. I've done it. Yeah, no, much to the, to the irritation of some of my readers, I, I must say, I, I've gotten my yeah. share. You would never call it hate mail, but I would call it ticked off mail. <laughs> uh, you know, why did you do this to so and so? You know, the funny thing is, is that I, I guess once, I actually got, I sort of ran out of gas on a character. This is in the first two, three books, four books, something like that, and he just didn't come alive enough for me, and I knew that he was not going to survive. So. I, I could absolutely set him up uh, to be uh, knocked off. And I even had Willie standing in line to do the proper gesture, which was cop to cop, just before they sealed the coffin, Willie laid a donut on his chest. Mm. That's a Willie moment, that. if ever there was one. Okay, so that was, I knew that, I saw that coming, that was cool. Uh, thereafter, I never see that coming. Uh, I write the books and all of a sudden there may be a magic moment whereby the termination of a regular might present itself and I'll go probably at the writing of the sentence in which it happens is where I'll get the memo that this is going to happen. And it's odd. There's one particular one I'm referring to, which I, I really don't want to get into details to screw it up for other people. I get in trouble for that, too, because I babble too much about these books. I figure everyone knows what I know, uh, which they shouldn't <laughs> in more ways than one. So uh, the uh, punchline was that I dispatched this person. I stopped mid-stride because there was a choice there absolutely it didn't need to happen and this person didn't need to be on the receiving end of a bullet I mean there were a variety of choices available and I stopped dead in my tracks and I went oh my god you know what why did I do that how what was and do I survive that does Joe survive it it was someone very close to him and I realized, you know what, that's the life I inhabit. I mean, for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, I mean, I'm not kidding. I go into people's houses where someone just died. And only rarely have they said, yeah, this turns out just the way I wanted it to. <laughs> that usually then involves people being arrested. Yeah. Generally speaking, they're heartbroken, they're stunned, they never saw that freight train coming. And here I am at my own death, if you will, my own conjured up death of someone else, thinking to myself, God, I, I didn't see that coming. Huh. Precisely the point. So instead of going, oh, God, well, that was, that was crazy, I went over that, now I'll bring her back to life and, and we'll continue. I went, nope, I'm going to live with the consequences of this. This is what happens. And so I continued writing. And, and everyone else survived, more or less. Hearts, you know, damaged or broken, just like in real life. So in a funny kind of way, I, everyone's got the dropsies. I feel like I'm left out. I, there's a perfectly good glass of water. I could do some serious damage here. Um, anyhow, that was my book you dropped. It was, yeah. <laughs> and it's a library book, too. Oh, no. Sacrilege. Uh, I had a very eccentric grandmother who also died in her 90s. And she used to label everything. And one of the labels on her favorite dictionary was, if this book's 
gets dropped one more time, the spine will break. I mean, can you imagine a sign that big? And she didn't <laughs> see very well. It covered the entire book. It's probably Webster's International. She'd been dead for 20 years. You know, it had been dropped 40 times since then. It was still very solid. You know, I digress. I know that answered a question about killing somebody off. Was it to your satisfaction? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just shut the hell up. I'm very sad with the <laughs> okay, that's a mercy killing. We'll leave you alone. Yes, sir. Can you make a, a living writing, or why are you doing all the other things that you do? Ah, well, because uh, from the get-go, uh, I never wanted to look in the mirror and see just a writer. I wanted to see someone who could contribute to society and work for the better good, be of use to my fellow human being uh, and uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and an author is not that? But... No, an author is not that. An author supplies uh, comfort, uh, perhaps education, perhaps a shared experience of the human condition, but in terms of putting your hands on another human being and improving their day in an extraordinarily direct and visceral way, no, nah, writers are useless. Okay. <laughs> now, I love being a writer. I am on earth to be a storyteller. This works for me. And I, in fact, sort of migrated from thinking of this as uh, a craft into admitting that I actually practice an art. And I, I'm now comfortable with that, although I haven't found a beret that fits my fat head yet. So we're not probably going to end up going there. But it is important to me, and I, I don't belittle it or diminish it or anything else. What writing you're going to get out of me is the best goddamn writing I am capable of delivering. I, I work very hard because that's what you deserve. And, uh, but... Having said all that, I want to be a constructive part of the human race. And that means that I've got capabilities, I've got uh, stamina, I've got um, a demeanor, if you will, about other people's chaos, uh, and uh, th that allows me to get into the down and dirty, ugly, smelly, bloody, messy stuff and not have it affect me. So why not take a personality of that sort and put it to use in that arena? Uh, very quickly and early on, um, I joined the fire department. We already touched on the fact that I was traveling everywhere, moving, moving, moving all the time. You don't belong anywhere when you do that. You're too busy acquiring languages, customs and habituating to cultures so that people don't beat you up for being the outsider or the weirdo. Okay, so uh, that's my entire youth. I figure all that out. I come to Vermont. I finally let out a, a, a you know, blow of relief and I go, okay, so everybody else has their youth in one place. Everybody else. Most people have their youth in one place. And they, they see the fire department or the police department or whatnot. They know the people who are around them doing this kind of stuff. I don't. So I get to use or live my life upside down and backwards. Okay, so now I get to embrace my youth, whereas I was born an old man, if you will. Okay, so I joined the fire department. I began responding to that area. Um, immediately became an EMT, shortly thereafter became the captain of the rescue squad just because I can't get enough of that kind of education. And being self-employed, I essentially was born with a pager on my hip when I came to Vermont. And I, curious enough, still got it. So uh, that readiness, that availability, uh, that eagerness all conspired to make me Johnny on the spot when everyone else, they were at work or they were doing something else, you know, driving an 18-wheeler or whatever they were doing. And I was available in town. So I got a lot of early experience in emergency responses. And it wasn't long thereafter 
uh, part and parcel of my research. Of course, I'm spending, uh, shall we say, an embarrassing amount of time at the medical examiner's office learning how they do what they do. Uh, and when they shifted their organization to non-MD death investigators, which was a mess, uh, and not working better, and medicine was getting more and more and more paper bound and complex, and doctors were going, look, I don't have the time to be a death investigator on top of everything else, so I'm out of it. Then they switched over to people exactly like me, guys that were getting up uh, in the middle of the night, responding happily and eagerly to all sorts of chaos, and they just said, you want another pager? And you don't even think twice, you go, oh yeah, sure, what the hell, what's another one? At the peak, I had three pagers on my belt, uh, one of whom had two separate channels. So everyone was paging and beeping, and I loved it because this was ketchup. My entire life was spent avoiding all of this kind of involvement. I was the outsider's outsider. One of the reasons I became a writer is because that's what writers are. They're observers. They stay out. And to this day, when I go to a death scene, and there is all this stuff in the air and on the floor and underfoot and all of everything else, I'm an outsider. I'm watching. I'm taking notes. I'm remembering stuff. I'm dealing with crisis. I'm applying the bomb such as I have it to bring people back down to earth and steady their nerves. Do I have to frankly say, does it strike me emotionally? No, it does not. I don't have that kind of background. Uh, on that level, we all have baggage, we all have school of hard knocks that we encountered. I've got mine, which I earned at a very early life, and that protected me to this day against other people's chaos and misery. I watch it, I calm it down, I address it, but I don't feel it. And this allows me to document, to remember, to recall, to analyze, to balance all the stuff I see. So going back to the little brief life history, um, the medical examiner's office created this new system whereby they use non-MDs. And within two months, I started getting phone calls. Well, we, we changed the rules. Where the hell are you? <laughs> that was literally what the chief ME at the time said. Uh, okay, so I drove up there, and they run you through a battery of tests, make sure you're psychologically balanced. <coughs> Obviously, they made an exception for me. <laughs> um, and you know, I went, and that was, I believe, something like 18 years ago now. Time flies. You're having fun. <laughs> um, so uh, thereafter, you were, of course, interacting with law enforcement every time you go out because that's the rules of engagement in the state of Vermont, is that there are three offices that need to be represented at every investigation of a death. And that is the local law enforcement, whoever that may be, uh, the medical examiner's office, and the state's attorney's office, always available by phone, unless there are press photographers, in which case they show up in person. So, uh, well, you know, got to be practical. So, uh, one of these cops is also uh, talking about a case to me over lunch after the fact, um, and we're just sorting out a few details. And he looks at me and he says, you want, a, you want a job? We're actually hiring at the Bellows Falls Police Department. Bellows Falls. I mean, that's like a stand-up joke in those days. Of course, if you do what I do, you got to work at Bellows Falls. I mean, it's <laughs> chaos central. You know? <laughs> so, that was the Bad News Bears capital. Uh, and statistically, there was a guy named Max Schluter uh, who uh, kept the number crunching for the state of Vermont. And a uh, lovely guy. And he, uh, he was the one who told me that uh, his personal nickname for Bells Falls in those days was Dodge City. <laughs> so uh, I'll give you an idea. Now that's all per capita, obviously. You know, Burlington is the mothership uh, of, uh, of bad news. But uh, on a per capita basis, nothing beat Bell's Falls in those days. So this guy said, would you like a job there? And I went, in a heartbeat. Not before I looked at him and said, do you know how old I am? <laughs> this was not all that long ago. It was about 17 years ago. So, um, and he said, that's exactly why we're asking you. Which I thought was remarkably insightful on their part. 
and really devious. I thought that was elder abuse, to be perfectly <laughs> honest, because it got me in my weak spot. I'm like, oh, of course I'll work for you now. So they put me to work, uh, and that's what started the, the other ball going in terms of, uh, of that employment. Now, obviously, the, the firefighting EMS was by and large volunteer. Some of the EMS jobs, I did national ski patrol, I ran for ambulances and rescue squads. I had four or five EMS jobs simultaneously at one point here, go all the pages. Um, and some of those pages, because you don't have a choice, they're not volunteer organizations. Um, but most of that was volunteer. Um, then, um, obviously, law enforcement, uh, medical examiner, those are just regular jobs. Um, so at my peak, I had three simultaneous full-time jobs, um, which was great because at that point I could give uh, 18 hours a day to these various occupations. And of course, since mostly they're emergency driven, and of course I'm a contractor also, so you know I can always say, "Hey, you want to fire me? Fine, you know, but I'm not going to sit around and do nothing in your office on a nine-to-five basis. I'm going to show up at your office, do work, and leave." I'll put in my hours, but I'll put them in when I want to put them in. So at 2 a.m. I might be in the cop shop doing stuff that other people would only do from 9 to 5. So it all worked out. Uh, and it all fit my rather bizarre, panic-driven personality. <laughs> um, so, uh, long story short, I felt that I was finally being of use to my fellow citizen along my guidelines. Uh, I was writing books, which I was, in fact, doing for a living. I answered this question, didn't I? Uh, so uh, now that average income of 6000 bucks, I do a lot better than that. Uh, and I'm no Stephen King, but I've been making a living at this for now since 1980. Uh, uh, except for that one time with my father. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, and of course, you know, it, it helps in Vermont. Vermont has also trained me, as did my Yankee father, don't get greedy. <laughs> so our expectations are lower than they beg me in New York City or elsewhere, you know, where people say, oh, well, the cost of living is such. Well, you know, all of us look at that cost of living and go, what are you on, smack? You know, you don't need that much to live. You can live on a lot less. And so that's what I do. Uh, and it works out fine. And, uh, but I do count myself among the lucky because if someone says you're making a living as a writer, well, you must be Stephen King. Uh, there is a middle class of writer. Uh, and I'm a happy and proud representative of that. Uh, you can make it happen. And for all of you, just in case you want to know, uh, just got another contract for three more books Yay. from New York City. So, yeah. Yay. Yeah. Yay. More in the pipeline <laughs> from Unkillable Joe Gunther. Yay! Three Thank more. God. Yeah. yeah. Is that three more after the one you're already writing? Uh, let's see. No. Let, uh, God, what is it? Margo's the boss. She actually knows. Margo's my wife. Um, <laughs> bombers God, Moon you, and Bombers Moon number th it's their number thirty. So it's no no, we got three more after Bombers Moon. Ooh. So Bombers Moon is uh, so next year's more. book is the end of the that's the thirtieth. So I got three more after that. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <There's> nothing. <laughs> but good nodding. Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I enjoy your description of Brattleboro and small communities and the people in them. Do you get pushback from some of the people in those communities? No, no. Uh, you, it, the crazy thing is, instead of pushback, they actually ask for their community to be included in the next homicide. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly bloody-minded librarians. <laughs> <laughs> they all want their patrons dead in the aisles. <laughs> really weird. Uh, I, that. I think people... They understand that uh, even the residents of Bellows Falls, uh, about which I can be a little tough, everything I learned about Bellows Falls, I learned in Bellows Falls, from residents of Bellows Falls, and the more honest among them will recognize that fact. So, yes, the Chamber of Commerce may not be crazy about me in Bellows Falls, but funnily enough, there is a, I think she's retired by now, but for a long time, one of the selectmen at Bellows Falls was fresh to the neighborhood 
Uh, I don't know where she came from, but somewhere away. And she came into Vermont and came into Vellas Falls, decided, well, I'm bored, I need something to do. And since I got no job and I can do this, I'm going to run for a select person and win. So she won. So she comes to one of these, which I call an author imitation. Um, and I don't like the real version, so I make these up. And she uh, raises her hand and she says, Hi, I'm so-and-so, uh, and, -so, and I'm uh, on the board of trustee of Bells Falls. And, and I think uh, what you did in your book, Bells Falls, was uh, execrable and uh, demeaning and insulting. Uh, and basically, uh, using my words and not hers, I think you're a toad. <laughs> and, uh, so I went, uh, did you read the book? I ain't a cop for nothing. <laughs> and uh, she said, I'm not going to read a book like that. Uh, everybody else started laughing. <laughs> it was like when, uh, I, you know, I don't want to make this political, but it was like when Trump stood up in the United Nations and made that one line or whatever and started laughing. It was the same kind of like, are you kidding me? You know, you're going to criticize a book you never read? <laughs> so um, that sort of quelled her enthusiasm and the conversation ended and I went on to the next question. And I'll be damned if within six months, she didn't contact me personally, asked for an inscribed book, won an auction where her name could be used in a future book, and has been talking me up ever since because guess what she did? She, she read, the she read the book. <laughs> so even in a case like that, they come to realize, okay, it's a tough town. But the conclusion of the book, Bellows Falls, uh, ends on a note of hopefulness. Mm -hmm. you know? It's a hard locked town, I'm not going to tell you otherwise. But I'm also not going to say that they don't try like crazy to make it a better place to live. You know, And it certainly was uh, since when I first crossed its threshold. Uh, so most towns see that. Brattleboro, you're right. I write more about Brattleboro because it's the town nearest to where I lived, right outside of town. and. Uh, they sure can't get enough of them. They've, they've taken them in stride. They like them a lot. I get, you know, run up the flagpole in the newspaper in a positive way um, versus the yard arm. And, and uh, all's well. And like I said, I, I really have gotten, gosh, I'm, I'm hard put, other than what I just rattled off of those salts, I'm hard put to think of anybody who's really come back at me there was this one guy who didn't like, he wrote a letter to me with no return address. The real cranks always do that. <laughs> uh, and said, uh, I hate what you did with this one character. Uh, you gave him an Irish last name and said he had a drinking problem. And I'm sick and tired of the Irish all being reduced to drunks. Uh, and as it turns out, if you again, if you read the book, he didn't have an Irish name. His nickname sounded like an Irish name. So it was a, just a complete, I was like, I can't even respond because there was no return address. But over 30 years of cranking this stuff out, that's all I can remember. So either someone's burning my mail or I'm doing okay. <laughs> Not sure which. Marta would know. She would burn my mail. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Have you ever been approached about adapting any of your books for TV? I, I have. TV and movies. Uh, it comes uh, up now and then. We're under contract right now. Fingers are crossed. Uh, and, and we'll see what happens. You know, it, it has always struck me as a natural thing to do. Uh, one of my 433 previous lives was as a photographer. I'm very visually oriented um, for a writer. <laughs> and uh, when I write, I, I, I have in my head the same movie I hope you end up with when you're reading. Because I, I never forget that you always write for readers. And you, as a writer, are a reader first and foremost. I mean, in other words, don't forget your roots. You came into writing as a reader and you're delivering your product to readers. So never forget that. Uh, yeah, I'll repeat your question, though, because I don't want to. This one I can recall. Uh, has anybody been. Yeah, yeah, the movie, 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 movie. Yeah. So, therefore, you can see where 
I, I think this is a natural segue to go from these books, which I wrote visually, to end up visual. And, and uh, like I said, you know, we're, we're arm wrestling over contracts and doing just the standard stuff that you always do. What uh, but all, what's that? Which book? Uh, all of them now. I mean, they start at the beginning of the series, and that's all we sort of talk about. But the understanding might be that if we actually get lucky with this one, and you don't always. I mean, I, I've had this a couple of times before, and it falls through for whatever reason. Um, some of them really petty. I'll, I'll share a story uh, that just is over the top dumb, and I've probably already told it to you before. But. Um, there was a long, long time ago, uh, there was a bunch of folks you know, in an office in Hollywood, the real Hollywood, and there were like nine of them, and they were literally there to sign a contract for a Joe Gunther series or movie, I can't even remember what it was. And the last guy to arrive sees like the, th the third guy to have arrived, and they're all just whatever they're doing, you know, playing with their ties. And he stops dead in his tracks and he says, I didn't know you were in on this deal talking to the third guy arrived. He says, um, remember how you screwed me over <laughs> three years ago on that other deal? Well, payback's a bitch. And he turned on his heel and he walked out. <laughs> and the guy who called me up was literally crying on the phone because he said, we had a deal. But we can't do it without this one guy. And it had nothing to do with the series. It was just, welcome to Hollywood. You know, <laughs> very strange town. Um, I'm going to live as, about as far away from Hollywood as I can physically get for probably good reason. All that having been said, we, I think we're uh, in cahoots with sane people, and uh, we're just going to see where it goes. So I, I can't answer you flat out uh, because it's in development. It makes me feel like I'm floating in hypo or something. But, uh, but uh, yeah, you know, fingers crossed. Didn't you tell a story last year about a son and a producer and a T-shirt? Yeah, that's him. That's, that's him. Yeah. That's him. It's same, yeah, it's the same thing. These things take a long time. Man. Wow. This, this, no, this, yeah. No, it can be a very prolonged thing. But yeah, the, the story, I don't know. Did you hear that one? I about missed how, that one, no. Yeah. You didn't? Okay. It's, it's actually fairly sweet. So my son lives down in Texas, and, and he uh, does things like Habitat for Humanity, and I don't understand where he gets all this altruism, help your fellow human being stuff. Uh, no, <laughs> total nonsense, but he does it anyhow. Um, and uh, so he's off there helping to build uh, houses, and there's this young man there, and indeed there was a T-shirt, either my son or he had, you know, had Vermont, and, and so there's my son, the Texan so to speak. Uh, and he looks at this guy and goes, my God, you know, who knew my father, you know, lives in Vermont. And the guy goes, oh, my favorite author is from Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> so you could fill in the immediate blank, blank, blank. And then my son, of course, very politely says, so what do you do for a living? And the guy says, I make movies. <laughs> so that's, that's where this oh, wow. all started out. Oh, but wow. but, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a tough road to hold. I really feel badly for these guys because, God, the, 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 the nutty people they need to deal with and wrestle with and contract with and the number of frustrations they have to encounter. And, of course, I'm just writing books, so you know, I don't have to worry about what their uh, lives are. But it, it must not be enviable. But it's alive, and we'll see if it's well <laughs> next year. Ask me the same question. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, oh, she seems to be rising to her feet. Okay, I guess. Oh, yeah, good lord. Huh. Oh, I'm no, very impressed you didn't throw something hard at my head. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh,